Hi, I'm Jenny Tooley, and I am on a mission to uncover how artists like myself make their lives work. I have stayed in the shadows. Today, I'm talking with visual artist Marianne Gargor. She's an oil painter who paints traditional subjects with a contemporary flair. Marianne also passionately balances family life and her role as creative director of MG Painting and Design. We're meeting at Marianne's studio in Dallas Creative Space, which is the largest and oldest North Texas artist community. Dallas Creative Space is located in the historic Continental Gin Building in Dallas's artsy Deep Ellum neighborhood. Call it. Marianne, take one. Hello, Marianne. Thank you so much for being with me today. I'm so grateful I got to come to your beautiful studio. Thank you for coming. We're going to get the cookie started right now. All right, I'm ready. Uh, you told me that you wanted a chocolate chip cookie. Yes, I'm on a diet, but I can have a bite. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I <laughs> may have busted your diet here. Uh, can we bring the cookie over? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I made you a giant chocolate chip cookie. You have been very busy. Because you Thank told you. me the last time I was here oh. that you were only doing big right now. Yes, I am working big, <laughs> and this is definitely a big cookie. Beautiful. So we have the giant chocolate chip cookie for you. I guess I have a permission today to have a little bite. Mm. Mm. So when you told me that you were only going big from now on, mm -hmm. what did you mean? Well, I sort of tried to consider the pieces that struck me as the most powerful in my work and mm -hmm. the ones that conveyed what I was trying to express the most. And I found that the larger pieces allowed me to breathe deeply into my work and push my work further. Okay. So I was meaning by size, physically. So when I moved into the studio, I was working in little canvases. And over the years, I, the first week I saw, I ordered five canvases that were 48 by 48. Because mm -hmm. instantly I was working larger. And I go back and forth, but now I've decided to give myself some parameters okay. in which to grow. Mm -hmm. And so it's been fun. Once you make a decision, you kind of forget about it and you fall into it naturally. And then did it affect you? Because I know that you then shipped those pieces mm -hmm. out. Yes. <laughs> did your creative decision then affect you in kind of a, an administrative or like a practical kind of way? Yes, yes. Uh, the planning of getting uh, 20 paintings to my next show across the country were deeply affected by the size of the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I had to recognize that I have to plan a little further ahead. Mm -hmm. And as, you know, as an artist, I was painting until the last hour, making sure it was perfect the way I wanted, mm -hmm. but it takes a little more forethought than that. But I, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. When I was a bit daunted, someone reminded me, look at how exciting your life is. You're finishing paintings, you're sending them, you're preparing a show. You're worrying about details that most people would love to be worrying about. So mm -hmm. thinking big sometimes isn't always convenient. And I think that's kind of the theme of being an artist. It, it's, it's not convenient. It isn't convenient. No, it's dirty, it's messy, it's ambiguous, but it's thrilling and challenging. And uh, you never really know what is in the future. Right. So you have to be comfortable with that. So let's get from the future back mm -hmm. to the past a mm -hmm. little bit. When you were little, did you know that you, were you a creative child or did you, or were you also goal oriented? Both. Both. I was pretty type A kid, mm -hmm. always worried about my grades and all that. But I would stay with my father who was a doctor and he would just put me in the hospital and I would just copy out of art books all the time. And, mm -hmm. and then I was lucky enough in high school to land on a very great high school art teacher. And he sort of took us out of the suburban malaise and shook our world. He put stereo equipment in the walls. He signed our notes if we wanted to skip class. Oh. He had a still life that was up on the ceiling. It was all white onto a table and it was hooked on the, t on the ceiling and we got to paint from it. And he just taught us to uh, smell the roses and get off the wrong bus stop a little bit more. And it was mind blowing change. Were you as a child in high schooler. For me, I was definitely, I didn't quite fit in. I grew up in Lucas, Texas, loved being outside in nature, went to Allen High School, totally did not, like there was not a place. I didn't fit into yes. any of the groups really at all. Yes. And I didn't even fit into the, like, like the art kids because I couldn't draw, mm. which was interesting. Like, right. Where do creative kids live? And did you, how did you fit in when you were growing up? 
uh, it's very similar to your description. Mm -hmm. I was friends with everyone. I was an I was an extroverted artist, which was always a duality in my life that I that put me in created un, lack of clarity. But it was fun. But I had friends in every domain. Mm -hmm. But thank but thank goodness we had a great uh, artist uh, department. And I think you know the idea of supporting the arts is so important because it, it gave my originality and my need for creativity a place. And I think mm -hmm. about how many places, how many schools don't have that. Yes. And so what happens? What happens to teenagers that don't have an outlet? And we can think of all the variations of things that happen to kids who can't be original. Mm -hmm. And that's happening more and more right now as the arts programs mm -hmm. get slashed out of school. It's true. Are you able to self-support with your art right now? You know, it's an incremental growth. Mm -hmm. I admit that I've always had a supportive family. Mm -hmm. my, uh, my husband has always uh, been very stable, but uh, I've, I've always had to contribute to the household. So I've always had fire on that edge. And it's good, I think, yeah. having to, to finance part of your household or all of it. All of it's harder, I think. All of it really might take a little bit of the, the joy out of it. But I think, you know, every, you know, what is it? Necessity is the mother invention. Mm -hmm. So I found that the need to support my family partially has put fire on me to yes. work harder, better, smarter. And so I've enjoyed that challenge, but I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, my husband has always said to me, uh, follow your bliss. Always, even when I had, you know, the cushier jobs, corporate cushier jobs. And even growing up, you know, when I left uh, medicine, my father, who's a doctor, said, just go for it. So I've always been, I think that's been a blessing because there's so much doubt involved in being an artist yes. that if you don't have the people you love supporting you, I think it takes finding that community to support you. If you don't have it, you just have to find it. When I left advertising, um, I, f I fell into some books that were really good, and the premise of the books helped me decide, decide right then and there that I completely reject the starving artist model. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge change for me. It was a game changer in that I understood that I needed to treat my art um, like any other uh, serious profession. Mm -hmm. I needed to show up every day, nine to five. There have been different changes of mindset, but still, you know, always showing up being consistent, being persistent. And, um, you know, it's a funny game with the arts because you can start being humming a workaholic and acting like every other working person in the world. But at the same time, you have to continuously be playful. It's this funny balance between work hard and explore hard. Mm -hmm. But I think that that was a big deal for me to understand that if I wanted to not be poor as an artist, I did not have to be that this was some sort of stigma that uh, was attached to artists. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be, uh, you know, a, a morose artist sitting in the corner eating my tube of paint. Right. I embrace life and joy and success, and I want the fine things in life and the ephemeral things in life and everything in between. But so I had to decide. I had to decide that I was worth it. Yeah, I, I, we did a sabbatical in Boston, and I read a great book called Essentialism. And the premise was, you know, um, this guy got rid of anything extra that he was doing at his job. So he had more time to go home. When he went home, he got to exercise. So he was healthier, happier with his family. And he got the biggest bonus of his life. Mm -hmm. And that impacted me when I talked to you about the larger canvases. It, I came back from, from uh, my sabbatical with my husband and my family saying, um, staying really busy is sometimes learned helplessness. <laughs> yeah. You convince yourself that that's the only mode that you can manage. So I, I, you know, at one point I was, you know, selling cards, selling posters, teaching art, selling large paintings, small paintings, doing the art fairs, doing the gallery, you know, so many parts because I felt like I have to be a merchant. I have to sell everything. I have mm -hmm. to be accessible to everyone. And then finally I said, I would love to make, you know, 25 deep penetrating beautiful works that mean so much to me and survive on that mm -hmm. and maybe a couple other things that mean something to me mm -hmm. so that I can have a peace of mind so that I can also think at a higher level like bigger projects mm -hmm. uh, just like as for you you can't do a thousand little ones then where's the the one that is like out there mm -hmm. so I think that less is more is a 
maybe something that happens when you reach a little more maturity. Well, I've actually had to learn how to do nothing. Nothing, that's a concept. I don't, know, I don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> I take two days off a week now because as an artist, as a creative person, as an entrepreneur, I can work every day of oh, the yeah. week. There's no day a week. What's a hobby? It's, I don't know. I don't know either. I turn it into a job. <laughs> So I've now required myself mm. to take two days off a week where I am wow. not allowed to schedule anything. Oh. Oh. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I can spontaneously do things throughout the day if I want to. Like you can actually garden instead of watching the plant die in yeah. front of you? Or I can go to a movie, but I don't have to go to the movie. And it's been hard, mm -hmm. but my temperament and has changed significantly. Oh. Yeah. yeah, you seem like you have a nice low hum. I'm, an, I'm, I'm a pretty low hum. I used to be a really high one. That's <laughs> really good. Tell me more about how you balance your family life. The model I understand, because I'm married with two children, mm -hmm. is um, total equality, mm -hmm. irregardless of financial differences, total respect. So my husband respects what I do and I respect what he does. And that balancing of respect is everything. Because when he's under the pressure and he knows I have a little looseness in my schedule, I pick up the slack. Mm -hmm. And when he knows that I'm really under the gun, he doesn't say, why are you going to the studio? I have people I know whose the respect around the arts is not as high. Mm -hmm. It's not as valued, you know? And uh, we have complete respect. So it's just that yin and yang in the house and the kids are getting older. Mm -hmm. And there's expectation that they manage and I'd, I'd love to be a hoverer. I would love it. I'd probably nature, my nature is more like, what are you doing? How are you doing? But luckily for them, I pop in, I swoon in, I cause chaos. I call the teachers and order that everyone works hard and then I disappear and work. Mm -hmm. So they know that, so I think it gives them an opportunity to uh, find their own balance. And I just want them to all, everyone to find their passion and, uh, you know, hold up their end, end of the, we all hold up our we all hold up our part in the household. And mm -hmm. I think that's the way it should be. As women, I think we're so trained, it's hard genetically even to recognize that we, we do have permission to be creative, authentic, bold, brash, outgoing, successful, and equals in the household. And um, we are natural nurturers as, as are many, many males. But I think we should be allowed People who want to be nurturers should be allowed to be nurturers, and people who want to be authentic creatives or out in the world should be allowed. And that that harmony is essential, I think, comes down to respect. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Do you do you find your own balance in your life? Are you have are you with someone or family or on your own, or how are you balancing your? I have always, I've never had children because mm -hmm. one, I knew that they were going to run all over me. They <laughs> and it wasn't until I was my mid thirties that I had enough boundaries that yeah. that was going to work out. Yeah, it's not necessary for everyone. I agree. And I would have also just given everything um, and none of us would probably have been very happy. Mm -hmm. uh, so somehow I was able to, uh, I don't know if it was a specific decision, but I just knew. Yeah. And I've never had a partner. I, I, the partners that I've had have all been working artists, mm -hmm. musicians, actors, that kind of thing. So they understand. It, they understand this, but like if we had a family, I knew it was going to come to me. Because that that's the next level of, of under, that's the assumption. Yeah, and, and so there was just no way. Their boundaries were so specific and mm -hmm. their goals were so specific that I knew that that would be secondary. Yeah. And that knowing me, I would step up to take, yeah. fill that space. Yeah. Um, so I've made some pretty specific decisions knowing the partners that I've had yeah. that I was not gonna start a family because I knew that I needed to be able to do my work too. Yes, and that's, that's pretty insightful to understand that part of you, mm -hmm. you know, I think Otherwise, you uh, struggle against your intuition in your work life. And I think that's really, you know, five years ago, I was asked to talk at some school. And it was a bunch of cute high schoolers at Booker T. And I did everything I could to not tell them to run, run the other direction from the arts. Mm. Because I hadn't come to understand what I needed 
in the arts. What I needed as a person mm -hmm. to, to manage my career and my work. And now once I understood I need people, mm -hmm. I need success, I need these parts, but people. And then when you find that balance, like you knew that you, that having a family would just take it from you. Mm -hmm. And I had to find what I needed in order to yeah. balance my art life. And I think that's the insight people have to find is what do they need? What do they really need? Or what do they not want? What do they want? Mm -hmm. And that takes a little thought, but I think it's important because then you can, then you're happier. You're, you're at peace with your choices. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground. I do too. I thank you so much for including me in uh, Smart Cookies. I'm delighted. I'm so grateful that you agreed to do it. And That's I got to know more about you. Likewise. <laughs>